Good evening and welcome to the Embassy of Canada uh, for the 16th annual Samer Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs, et bienvenue à l'Ambassade du Canada à Washington. My name is Martin Loken, and I'm one of the very lucky people who gets to work in this building. I head up the uh, political section, and it's uh, an honor to be hosting this event uh, once again with our good friends at the National Endowment uh, for Democracy. And a special welcome to uh, those of you here in the building for the very first time. Uh, we're thrilled to have this uh, wonderful piece of real estate on Pennsylvania Avenue. And this year, in fact, we celebrated our 30th uh, year and, uh, in this building. And for fully half of those years, we've been uh, hosting the uh, annual Lipset Lecture. So it's a very strong, uh, long-standing partnership. I'd like to thank uh, Sydney Lipset for being with us here this evening. Thank you, Sydney. And uh, like everybody else, looking forward very much to uh, our speaker uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Lena Manjupipiti, and she'll be introduced shortly. So we're happy to host this event because advancing democracy is a core value that underpins Canada's foreign policy and international assistance. Advancing democracy contributes to peace and security, prosperity, sustainable development, and the rules-based international order. Inclusive and accountable governance, peaceful pluralism, gender equality, and respect for diversity, human rights, and the rule of law are key elements of successful and sustainable democratic societies. And Canada is committed to countering threats to our democracy. One of these is foreign threats to elections, something that Canada very closely monitors, especially in the lead up to our own federal election that took place just last month. Canada has taken a leadership role in this issue, including in the G7 context by establishing and leading the G7 rapid response mechanism to strengthen our coordination in identifying and responding to diverse and evolving threats to our democracies. Now, this is the third time that I've had the pleasure to open this lecture, and this time I remembered to, to bring along a book from home, a book from my shelf that actually is concrete evidence of what Professor Lipset spent much of his career doing, researching Canada as a way to gain insight to the democratic developments in the United States and elsewhere in the world. So, so the book I grabbed off my shelf, it's uh, called Continental Divide, the Values and Institutions of the United States and Canada. And it's one of uh, many pieces of his scholarship that uh, looked at Canada and the United States. And I was rereading the preface last night, and I was very intrigued that uh, Dr. Lipset grew inspiration for the title, Continental Divide, from uh, that famous political scientist, uh, John Belushi. Well, okay, no, actually, the, the actor John Belushi. So he wrote that in the 1981 movie Continental Divide, there's a scene where Belushi's character picks up and reads one of Lipset's earlier works, <laughs> Political Man. And, and he writes that that act inspired him to, to name the, the book uh, Continental Divide. So, so it all goes to show the value of, of drawing inspiration from uh, unexpected places. Now, now, by the way, one of the main themes of that movie, Continental Divide, was fighting corruption. And so I think that uh, links to, with the uh, theme of uh, this evening's talk. Um, now, an example of drawing inspiration from an expected and valuable place is our partnership with NED, uh, an organization that's done so much to grow and strengthen democratic institutions around the world. And as an, as an illustration of the respect that NED's President Carl Gershom enjoys, earlier this year he was actually invited to provide testimony to the Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Development of the House of Commons of Canada. Uh, this was in the context of a study that they were doing on Canada's role in supporting democratic development around the world. So, thank you, Carl, for supporting Canada's democratic process, and I would now like to invite you up to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, you know, it's my it's my great hope that uh, Canada will. They had a Ned before, uh, and they're they're now in the process of discussing whether or not to recreate it. And 
it's great, my great hope that this is something they'll do. And I think the foreign minister, Christy Freeland, is, is really committed to that. So let's see. So I want to thank you and the embassy for once again generously hosting uh, the Lipset Lecture. This is the 16th annual Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. And we appreciate the support and cooperation of the entire embassy, and especially that of Victoria Benner and Adrian Rooney. Uh, on the NET staff, I want to thank Melissa Ayton for all the work that she did on the lecture, uh, despite being distracted to the point of obsession in the last weeks by the playoffs and the World Series. But Melissa is OK now, don't worry. Uh, because the Nats finished the fight. Um, and I want to, uh, Ryan Eric assisted Melissa, and Brent Calmer prepared the layout for the printed edition of the uh, program, and I want to thank them as well. Not least, I want to thank tonight's sponsors, uh, and that, inclu that, that includes the Johns Hopkins University Press that publishes the Journal of Democracy and that is represented here tonight by Bill Brickner, and the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University that's represented by Judith Wildey. Both of them, I want to let them know how grateful we are. I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate Canada on the successful federal election that was held just two weeks ago today. Uh, in an article written after the election for the Globe and Mail, our two Canadian friends uh, Erwin Kotler and Brandon Silver called Canada a bastion of stability in tumultuous times, and indeed it is. But it was not always that way, and I distinctly remember how deeply worried Marty Lipset was about the threat to Canada's unity and its stability during the very close Qu Quebec independence referendum in 1995. Canadian federalism survived, and Canada today is a stronger and more unified country than ever before. It's a model of how to manage a difficult and divisive issue in a transparent and inclusive way. And I know that Marty would be very gratified by Canada's progress and success were he still with us, and I have no doubt that he would have transferred his anxiety today to our own country, the United States. I cannot overstate how important Canada is today as a democratic neighbor and a global advocate for democratic values. The Lipset Lecture is a symbol of U.S.-Canadian friendship at a time when relations based on common interests and shared values cannot any longer be taken for granted. We're gratified that this lecture contributes to strengthening this vitally important friendship. Of course, I also want to thank Sid Lipset, Marty's widow, who has once again helped us make available in pamphlet form a seminal essay by Marty that is related to the theme of the lecture. The pamphlet, which is available outside, is Some Social Requisites of democracy, and uh, accompanying it, there's a second essay that he wrote, Social Requisites of Democracy Revisited. And there's also a copy of Steady Work, which was uh, Marty's academic uh, memoir. Uh, and Sid's in devotion to ensuring that every aspect of the Lipset Lecture is done properly and with a certain elegance uh, makes the occasion a very special experience for all of her friends. So thank you, Sydney. This 16th annual Lipset Lecture is the last one uh, conceived and organized under the leadership of Mark Platner. As many of you are aware, Mark will be retiring in a few months. And Sid and I want him to know how deeply gr grateful we are to him, not just for his role in organizing and chairing this important event, but for the seminal contribution he has made to the understanding and defense of democratic ideas and values for the last 35 years, during which time he has been an indispensable part of the NED leadership. Mark will be publicly thanked on January 23rd 
at the event celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Journal of Democracy, which Mark has edited so brilliantly uh, for the last three decades. And I speak on behalf of the NET staff and the board and countless others, many of them here tonight in this room, in saying how much we admire Mark and how grateful we are to him for everything he's done and for the kind of person that he is. And it's now my honor to introduce Mark Plattner. Thank you, Carl, for those very generous words. I appreciate them. And it's a special pleasure for me to introduce my longtime friend, Alina Munju-Pippity, our speaker this evening at the 16th annual Seymour Martin Lipset Lecture on Democracy in the World. Since 2007, Alina has been a professor of democracy studies at the Herdy School of Governance in Berlin a kind of European counterpart to Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where she had previously spent a year as a Shorenstein Fellow in 1998 to 99. Alina is the founder and chair of the European Research Center on Anti-Corruption and State Building. And over the past two decades, she's established herself as one of the world's leading scholars on corruption and good governance. Alina was born and raised in Romania, where she earned a PhD in social psychology and was a professor at the National School of Administration and Political Science in Bucharest. She was very active on the Romanian political scene as the country struggled to pursue a transition to democracy. And she remains deeply engaged with developments there. In 1996, she serves as the first anti-communist news director of Romanian public broadcasting. And in that same year, she founded the Romanian Academic Society, the country's oldest, now the country's oldest think tank, which she headed for many years. In 2004, in the run-up to local and national elections in Romania, she played a leading role in organizing the Coalition for a Clean Parliament, a nationwide public adv advocacy and anti-corruption project that had considerable success. So Alina simultaneously has been a leading scholar based in Germany, one of the European Union's richest and most stable democracies, and a civil society activist in Romania, one of the EU's poorest and youngest democracies. As a result, she's been able to view the problems of democracy and good governance from these dual and often dueling perspectives. And I think this has made her sensitive both to the concerns of donor organizations that are trying to foster good governance in new democracies and to the obstacles and challenges faced by the recipients of such assistance. The overall conclusion of our research, about which she'll tell us more this evening, is that international efforts to fight corruption and export good governance to new democracies have met with disappointingly limited success. Alina's interest in discovering how corruption can be tamed has led her into a wide-ranging series of sociological, historical, and even philosophical inquiries. She's found herself compelled to explore the meaning of terms such as good governance, justice, and the rule of law, as well as the nature of modernity. Her analysis stresses the gap that separates the particularism that reigned in all past eras and still holds sway in much of the world today to separate, that separates that from the modern principle that she calls ethical universalism, which demands that all persons be treated equally and impartially. Although this principle is widely accepted in the contemporary world, few societies have been able to realize it in practice, and she wants to understand why that's the case. 
Alina is the author of The Quest for Good Governance, How Societies Develop Control of Corruption, and of A Tale of Two Villages, Coerced Modernization in the East European Countryside, uh, a book that evolved from a BBC documentary that she earlier had written and directed. She's also the co-editor of Ottomans into Europeans, State and Institution Building in Southeastern Europe, and with Ivan Krashtev, a previous Lipset lecturer, uh, the editor of Nationalism After Communism, Lessons Learned from Nation and State Building. Her new book, Europe's Burden, Promoting Good Governance Across Borders, will be published by Cambridge University Press later this month. Alina is a member both of the Research Council of NED's International Forum for Democratic Studies and of the editorial board of the Journal of Democracy. Over the past 15 years, she's contributed about a dozen articles and reviews to the journal's pages. Although some of her most widely cited essays focus on good governance and corruption, she's also addressed a wide range of other topics. These include the post-communist transformation in Europe and the former Soviet Union, the changing role of political parties, the impact of EU accession, the political situation in Romania, and Moldova's 2009 Twitter revolution. Nor is her creativity confined to the realm of social science and political analysis. In addition to the work she's produced for television, she's the author of a controversial play that was staged in Romania in 2005. And indeed, interest in the arts runs deep in her family. Her brother, Christian Munju, is the writer and director of the film Four Months, Three Weeks, and Two Days, which won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival in 2007. Alina is often provocative, and she's always interesting. But because she thinks faster than most people do, she's not always that easy to follow. And this occasionally leads to her being misunderstood. So please listen to her carefully. <laughs> Alina is a genuinely original thinker, as well as an entertaining speaker. And I'm confident that she'll provide us with some valuable new insights this evening. She, she promises she'll speak for only about 45 minutes tonight and will then take questions from the audience. So it's my great pleasure to give the floor to my friend Alina Munju Pippity. Thank you very much for this extremely kind introduction and indeed for, for the honor of being here. I think that the most remarkable thing about my biography I can say in one line, and this is I was 25 years old in the year when the War of Berlin went down. And since we celebrate 30 years this year, it is quite a remarkable moment, particularly these days when the celebrations are near. As many other young East European intellectuals, I really didn't see freedom coming, and therefore I had built for myself a complete life of evasion in culture. So in November 1989, without any kind of apprehension that everything is going to change, living in, in deep Ceausescu's Romania, I was actually writing a book about time, the concept of time, at the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. Those were exactly my concerns, and this is what we were discussing with other people minded like me. And so imagine what happened a month later when the events came. I mean, has anybody ever been so unprepared for the challenges that we had? People like us, uh, you know, who had, led, who had read Kant, but even Marx we didn't read because we loathed the fact that it was taught, you know, in, 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 uh, in political uh, indoctrination sessions. So I will confess it to you from the very start. The very first book on politics that I read was actually The Political Man by Seymour Martin Lipset in 1990. I read this before I read Aristotle's Politics. 
if you can imagine. And it stayed with me ever since. Even today, the, the two pieces that were printed in booklet are the pieces that I put in my syllabus in a class that I teach in Berlin, which is called Transitions to Good Governance. And I put them both because I like exactly this revisiting of this uh, historical idea of preconditions, which my students have a great need to, to hear since they're from 50 different countries. Of some of them uh, have really lost quite considerable hope in the last 30 years when they thought that they're going to get there. So what I'm going to do today is first, I'm going to give you the very cheerful lecture, since this is what Larry Diamond told me the moment when he announced me that I received this very prestigious uh, opportunity to, to present this lecture. And he said, please don't go down there and depress the people and tell them that the age of democracy promotion is over or we take it back from you immediately. <laughs> I said, no worries, no worries. I'm actually working on an essay on which is called the universalization of ethical universalism. So this can only be good. And he said, this is completely incomprehensible as it is called like this. But anyway, anyway, it doesn't sound so depressing. So yes, you know, go ahead and, and, and develop on, on this side, okay? So this was the part which later on I turned into the rise of good governance promotion. This is the universalization of ethical universalists. But then events really caught up with us this year. I mean, I was among the people who have been around quite a while looking more critically at this adventure of our lives, changing the whole world uh, and making it a better governed place. And I realized that it is actually only fair if I add the second part of the story, and this is how we came to the rise and fall of, of good governance, which is a more, um, you know, and the sequel, well, I'm waiting for Game of Thrones to lead, and then I'll return also on this. So what do I mean by this rise of, uh, of good governance? Well, it's enough to look in the news today or to basically uh, tune in your TV in every other day and you're going to hear people making these extraordinary claims on television. Today it's Lebanon. You know, but two weeks ago there was someone else. A few years ago there was Brazil. It's always someone on TV putting out sort of claims which were unheard 30 years ago when the world fell down. Because for many, many years, we thought that people only want freedom, right? This was at least for my generation, this was the number one demand, freedom. But people in Lebanon, they have freedom. You know, they have freedom, they have regular elections. The government that they have is the government that they elected. The governance that they have is a result of a very elaborate negotiation process. And in many, many ways, this governance is what, what held the country stabilized up after a devastating civil war. So whatever do they want? What they want, if you listen to them in all these TV stories, is that they want ethical universalism. I know this sounds a little bit barbaric, but what they want is the kind of government, yesterday I listened to an old lady on television who said like this, they said, I am tired of factions and of people representing factions and of people representing parties. We don't want any of this. We want a government which represents all of us. I says, all of us, who? I mean, they're Christians, they're Islamists. It's a very complicated party. All of us, like none of us, has any sort of distinguishing feature. Like we are all completely equal and indistinct, just comparable by our citizenship, which is completely universal. And the state treats us similarly, without knowing anything more about us. This is what people want. And this demand we have cultivated a lot in the past 25, 30 years with our anti-corruption campaigns globally. And it is quite extraordinary the success that these days it has. Maybe you remember when Brazil, before this uh, big anti-corruption operation, they had some sort of a, an international competition, a, a, a soccer championship of something of the sort. But people, instead of caring for sports, which they've always done in Brazil, they were instead protesting in the streets against building stadium. And we say, well, why are you protesting? You're not happy of Brazil having this event? We say, no, 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 what we want are better hospitals. We don't want stadium. We don't want stadium which have a fantastic construction standards because they're for FIFA, while hospitals which are for Brazilians, they have no construction standards. They're actually terribly built and with a lot of loss. And not have. This has been growing and growing and growing. So we now have an extraordinary global demand for a government which is rational, treats everybody impersonally, like in our books that we teach students, like in Max Weber books, right? Except that I do not 
No, you know, if this government exists, I mean, maybe this government exists in Canada, but not 100% sure even, even there, okay? So, I am structuring the, this narrative in three different parts. One is, how did we come to this? How did we come to the fact that this kind of government is considered the natural form of government? Which me as a social psychologist and who was training during Ceausescu's time to actually become a psychiatrist, I find it very difficult to understand. I mean, it is more difficult when I look around empirically in the world and in, I work a lot with historical case studies to conceive that government has always been something very partial and that whoever has more power tries to share benefits with friends and family. This is more or less how humans organize government. I mean, the rest are exceptions, you know. The few less than 30 countries in the world which are above 7.5 on control of corruption scale, they represent the minority in the world. But nevertheless, nevertheless, it seems that these days there is a consensus of this. So in the first part of the story, what I'll try to do is to try to explain a little bit the story of this idea. How did this idea come about and how did this idea conquer the world before going into the practice and into the risks of this philosophy that I, among others, have promoted quite a lot. So, my plot is this. In December 2005, in a distant Mexican town called Merida, which is otherwise known for its pyramids and iguanas, and not for this, this kind of unknown UN convention is adopted. Its name is United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Now, do United Nations conventions against anything matter very much? People will tell you not. You know, they are not non-binding. There are UN documents. People just implement them if they want. But nevertheless, it is quite extraordinary the fact that this in itself happened. This was adopted without any sort of opposition. If you remember when the Convention for Human Rights was adopted, there was a very strong dissident opinion. This dissident opinion came from countries that we still have divergence of opinions today. Countries like Iran, countries like Egypt, countries like Saudi Arabia, and they basically said that the Convention for Human Rights represents a cultural Western point of view of human rights. And their point of view was not really integrated and should have been. So in other words, there was a claim even from the birth of that convention to the fact that there can be different culturally relative ideas about human rights. And if you read your world value surveys, you would still see that this still exists. And in particular towards women, we still have different ideas about human rights. There's not one universal conception of human rights despite having one convention, right? But this never happened with the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. There was nobody who actually said, uh, you know, there can be differences in the way we organize governance. You hear this a lot. You hear this a lot in private. But nobody made this argument in public. Nobody said in public, you know, we have other ways of organizing government in our countries. In our countries, it's only natural to give a bribe. In our country, it's quite natural to favor one's relatives. This is what we have been doing for hundreds of years. Well, why shouldn't we do it? Nobody said that. Nobody said that. Amazing enough. And since nobody said that, what happened since in the last 15 years is that everybody step by step adopted and ratified this convention. And we have now come to quite extraordinary numbers. We have over 180 countries in the world which adopted the United Nations Conventions Against Corruption. And this convention asks for transparency and accountability of government and public sector. It asks for a social contract where every citizen is treated equally and fairly. Interesting enough, this convention doesn't have a definition of corruption. Because in the end of the day, they decided that it's not the exception of corruption that they make the convention about. Plus, they couldn't agree among themselves on good grounds. It's a very contentious terms. But they decided that they will put in the opposite, the benchmark of good governance, the ideal governance to which you want to reach. And therefore, it has all these things. Everybody treated equally and fairly. It is there. It was already actually in human rights conventions, but now it's spelled out very clearly consultation in the formulation of public policy and regulation. You know, 186 countries ratified that. Amazing enough. And nobody invaded them, nobody forced them. They by themselves adopted this contract in front of their own citizens. Independent judiciary and equality in front of the law, right? 
who didn't adopt it so far. Syria, North Korea, Andorra, and a few Caribbean islands are behind, but they are coming there, they are coming there. So, you know, in a three, four years, we're only going to have some very, very few, very few uh, planetary exceptions, countries which didn't adopt it. So am I then right in saying this rather obvious thing that it is the end of cultural relativism in governance? Everybody has now similar ideas of what good governance is and shares them across the whole world. Clear enough, all right? Of course, United Nations Convention Against Corruption doesn't have, doesn't have an intervention force, doesn't have battalions to send you know, down there or cruisers or whatever, but it doesn't matter because these governments now pledged to implement this towards their own citizens and their own citizens, like people in Lebanon, can hold them to account. And apparently they do. They do quite a lot these days. So how did we come here? How did we even come to the idea that you can have something like this? Obscure as it is, I'm sure most of you have never heard of this, but it's also fairly recent. And what you have heard of are people asking the implementation of this, even if you haven't heard of UNCAC before this evening. So what is this ethical universalist principle that it is as the basis of UNCAC? So basically the ethical universalism is this moral principle which conceives that people are treated equally and fairly. And in one way or another, you will find it across disciplines and even phrased like this, although perhaps it's not, you know, the a main, a main current coming out. And it has roughly three concepts which are related, but all three of them are necessary. The first is the equity idea. People who are equal in respect to their contribution, for instance, taxpayers, they should be also equal in respect to outcomes, to what government gives them. People are entitled to equal security protection, for instance, or to equal, equal respect from the health system. Then it is the concept of reciprocity, the assumption that fairness should be responded in kind. And finally, it is the concept of impartiality, which is in Max Weber's work called impersonality, but in fact it is roughly the, the same thing, a judgment which is completely free of favoritism. The government should not know anything about you, your gender, race, um, nationality, whatever. It should only know you as a taxpayer and treat you treat you as such, equally and impersonally. This is ethical universalism. In practice, of course, this means very few societies have managed to transpose this into governance, and that roughly means that you will have to have the implementation of this principle into basic equilibria, both very difficult uh, historically to reach. One is rule of law, the implementation of ethical universalism in law, and the other one is control of corruption, the implementation of the principle of ethical universalism in roughly the resource and the public goods distribution by a government. Those should also be distributed equally and fairly, though people very seldom speak about this. The reason we don't speak so often about this is that in developed countries, we tend to think very much of corruption as an exception, right? We presume that these norms are out there and the corrupt people are just, you know, people who infringe them, like in, uh, in the comedies of the 80s, which I remember from my youth, when they had this very nice uh, DDR, East German Minister of Internal Affairs, who only had one stamp, and he put this stamp on all the documents which came to his office. What did the stamp say? The stamp said, find him and kill him. And that is very much the idea that we have about corruption, that everything is okay and there's just one person there whom we should find and kill. Instead of thinking that there might be actually countries where we should find and kill everybody because just the rules by which the country operate are not these rules. They're not ethical universalistic rules. So where did this ethical universalism come from? And here is where I spend a lot of time in the essay just showing that, you know, it ended this way, but it could have ended otherwise. I mean, it's really a glorious, glorious conquest of the intellectual arena of the world, starting from a very restricted point of view. 
And of course, you know, the overall conception can be traced back to Aristotle and, and Plato because it always they define good government as government which is in general and not partial interest. If you remember, and this is the definition basically of ethical universalism from the onset. But the first promoter of, of ethical universalism was, of course, a Roman lawyer by the name of Cicero, who for the first time made a very long argument and explained ethical universalism both in principle, why it should work like this, and both on grounds of utility, why it is only practical to organize government on this basis. Why did he do that? Well, he did that because he was just an upstart. He was just an upstart who needed to fight against more privileged people. This is how ethical universalism comes about, by people who want equality because they are at a disadvantage. And Cicero was arguing in a very famous corruption trial, a corruption trial against the governor of Sicily, and the jury, the people who were listening to the trial, were all the peers of this governor of Sicily. They were not Cicero's peers. They were actually looking down at him. So he had to somehow, somehow organize this trial, which was not going to be won by evidence. It was not going to be won by evidence simply because there was no equality in front of the law. This jury formed by senators was preparing to find the governor of Sicily innocent and to make Cicero, you know, miss his, miss his career. And then Cicero did something very similar to what we do in anti-corruption today. He organized a naming and shaming campaign. He basically organized such a shaming campaign so that the senators in the jury could no longer disregard this evidence because their whole class would be at stake. And that was the first campaign to promote ethical universalism. And also there are these you know, lengthy and very well organized pages where he draws on, on Plato and Aristotle and where he explains that there's no other way of organizing a republic except on equality of treatment. Because simply it's impractical to find criteria to organize it otherwise. What criteria could you have? I mean, of course, all this argument is made in a society with slaves. Right? So it is an argument which is only made for people who are citizens. So for the start, you could say there is an alternative way of organization. Upper Hyde is an organ alternative way of organization. A society being all castes in an alternative way of organization. However, in the Roman Republican philosophy, you could not make the argument for those. And those, therefore, he makes the very practical argument nobody can come with another criteria to organize government in a republic except ethical universalism. And this is the argument that he makes in the Officius on Duties, and which I cite in the paper. But of course, from Cicero, the argument travels further. And even in my previous book, in, in the Quest for Good Governance, I had found, because again, during my completely useless readings of communist times, when I was reading anything, uh, with a colleague in medical school, at the time, we wrote a book which was very, very largely drawing on 12th and 13th century philosophy, if you can imagine. And therefore, I was one of the very few people who read, since you know, I had nothing better to do, who had read Aquinas, the major Catholic philosopher. And I had, in fact, found numerous pages citing Cicero and elaborating on Cicero and arguing that the government in medieval times, and this was the official theology of, of the government, could only be based on universalism and on equal treatment of everybody. So this official doctrine actually carried on. And of course, if this existed in, in uh, medieval times and also in the other philosophers that I cite, which of course derive from Aquinas, of course in Renaissance this argument could only but explode and in Enlightenment it becomes like a general argument. And of course in Enlightenment and in every period brings new arguments and contextualizes with the respective times. But nevertheless, it is an argument which you can find traveling and just enriching itself and becoming more and more and more popular. And who are the top promoters? I mean, of course, the top promoters come with the French Revolution. It is the French Revolution which takes with what had become by then an accepted intellectual norm, but existed only you know, among intellectuals, like, let's say, the circle of, uh, of friends of, uh, of Marie Antoinette or uh, Diderot or the other philosophers who were consulted by the European monarchs. 
But the French Revolution deliberately starts promoting ethical universalism. And this happens in particular with the directorate, even before Napoleon becomes first consul, but in particular after he becomes first consul. What do they do? They sell constitutions. Constitutions come from Paris to a number of Italian republics first that Napoleon creates, but then to other places as well. Switzerland is an example on which I dwell a lot in my book on Europe. I start with Switzerland because people have the misconception that Switzerland, this miracle of good governance, country number one in the world on happiness and competitiveness in every global competitiveness report, uh, this country is a homegrown miracle. No. This country is not a homegrown miracle. If you research it a little bit, you discover that Switzerland at the end of 18th century was very much like one of the developing countries from where my students come from or where I work today. It was a country where collective action problems were so pervasive that they didn't have a road because in order to do a road, two different cantons would have had to cooperate and people didn't do that. It was exactly the kind of image that paralyzes us today in development and how people ask themselves, how can we solve this collective action problem? Why shouldn't I just steal from the common purse, which seems more rational from my point of view, but in the same time destroys the development of the whole country? Now, how did this happen? Well, how did this end? They were invaded by the French. Of course, the French didn't invade Switzerland with the goal of making Switzerland the number one benchmark of the world, but out of sheer geopolitical interest. But it was not just geopolitical interest. I mean, gradually they developed the idea that it is better for France to be served surrounded by countries whose philosophy in government is very close to the philosophy of the French Revolution. And therefore, this standard constitution, Napoleon, for instance, wrote himself, apparently, most of the constitution of Switzerland, which was called this Malmaison constitution, or the act of mediation. Now, what did this constitution has, which was extraordinary novelty? First, it canceled all the privileges. Switzerland was based on privileges. It was based, I mean, these cities of Switzerland, Zurich and Bern and other cities, they simply had patriciates. And also it was based on the difference between urban and rural. Cities had all the privileges and peasants didn't have any. They were not even allowed to trade. And Napoleon just cancels all this. And he writes a letter actually to the Swiss in which he says, dear Swiss, the eyes of the whole world today looks at you. The world has changed. The kind of inequality which reigned until yesterday is no longer possible. From now on, we're going to have equality among nations. And in your particular case, since history made you into separate cantons, we're going to have equality among your cantons. And within cantons, we're going to have equality among everybody. This is how it's going to work. We are going to abolish all the privileges. And then the went goes on introducing other things. Separation of power, which was already popular in France, right? developed by um, Baron de Montesquieu, a magistrate and a philosopher, and a number of other reasons which he considered, but which are roughly the, the, the backbone of ethical universalism. And not all of them will resist in Switzerland after Napoleon, but they will nevertheless create the blueprint that the Swiss liberals are going to fight after the Vienna Congress and other things and manage in the end to, to preserve and restore. What other constitutions did I find? Everywhere. You know, Napoleon created, for instance, a republic in Milan, the Cisalpine Republic, created a republic in Genoa, created a republic in Napoli. All those all those have exactly the same characteristics. They basically introduce a bureaucracy which is impersonal. They abolish all the privileges that people still had, the big traders and whatever other, other people in these cities, and they, for the first time, create governments based on ethical universalism. Of course, and this influence ranges from roughly Sweden, where people forget that Sweden, which is, again, one of the three top well-governed countries in the world, people still forget that their, their ruling, uh, their uh, dynasty basically comes from one of Napoleon's uh, marshals. That's, that's still them who are still running uh, Sweden, right? And in other countries, other countries in Europe, in many countries it fails. In other countries they are emulated without Napoleon putting it. Prussia, for instance, emulates a part of it. Liberals push it and say, okay, is, this is more rational government the way this, this works. Well, this Republican, or let's say Napoleon, first promotion 
is followed then quite deliberately in a big promotion, in fact, during the French Empire. During the French Empire, there are lots of pages written by Napoleon III and a number of his advisors and intellectuals who inspired him. You being Americans, you might remember that he was not always lucky, you know, in his attempt of building good governance in countries, right? Mexico and other examples. But nevertheless, apart, apart whatever other reasons he had, he also had this ethical universalist promotion reasons, and he says about this very explicitly. I just give this example from Algeria, which I like, but there are others from his interventions in, um, in the Ottoman Empire, what was Syria, and later on they, they created Lebanon, where he wrote to his French governor in Algeria, this Duke of Malakoff, we need to persuade the Arabs that we have not come to Algeria to press and spoil them, but to bring them the benefits of civilization. The first condition of this is reciprocal respect of everybody's rights. And in fact, he tries to formalize collective land rights for the Arabs. And a number of, of attempts like this, which I'm not saying that they were good or bad, but for sure a part of these attempts were in fact meant to promote a kind of governance based on ethical universalism. Now, what are the tools, roughly, of this promotion? The tools are, first, this intellectual equipment, basically, the Baron de Montesquieu uh, separation of power principle, and whatever was in the Declaration of Human Rights. These were where they got their artillery. Second is this constitutional engineering, promoting this power separation. And third, of course, third, of course, and the most practical, proves to be the Napoleon Legal Code. The Napoleon Legal Code simply scripts this for everybody, and due to its simplicity and easiness to, to associate government, and the fact that it's more sort of value-free, it doesn't come with the armies, had an extraordinary influence. Had an extraordinary influence in Eastern Europe, had an extraordinary influence in the Middle East, where it was combined partly with, with Islamic law, and still has a lasting influence in Latin America. And of course, the Napoleonic Code, what does it bring? Legal transparency, complete abolition of any sort of privileges, and the number of things that we, day we take for granted, but in fact are ethical universalist promotion. So on top of the philosophy, I argue in the book that in fact what happens is that also a pattern of intervention is born. Of course, there are a lot of interventions which are just purely for profit, but there is also a distinct stream of intervention that I find, which is Western intervention to rationalize government in other people's countries and to promote ethical universalism and to promote equality and to promote a number of, of things like this. So in fact, I am documenting a number of historical and as down to our contemporary intervention of this promotion or restoration of ethical universalism abroad which is fairly unusual and which you find under different labels mixed with modernization, civilization, rationalization, westernization, Europeanization, and so forth, and which in the end, in the end, reach their, their conclusion with the Merida Convention, where in fact everybody agrees that this is how we should organize government. And here we are, that is the glorious part, you know. We brought it there. And in a way, I'm not excusing colonialism, but I'm saying this brand existed in, in colonialism, and you can find it. Some place is more successful, other more hidden. And now we come to what happened. I mean, someone could say from the start, I mean, but when, when, when was this generalization of this principle? Well, it's just only in 2004, right? So my husband, who's a medievalist historian, he always asked me, well, what are you doing? And I'm trying to see if something had an impact or not. And what is the interval of time you're looking at? I said, 20 years. And he said, 20 years? And you expect in 20 years for something to happen. I mean, what is 20 years at the scale? It's really very little. Well, you know, I'm a social scientist, I'm not a historian, so yes, I expect something to happen in 20 years, and I'll explain why it happened, so let's see what happened in these 20 years. Well, first, let's see where we are. I mean, these are all the countries in the world plotted on the World Bank control of corruption, in which, rated from 1 to 10, in which 10 is the best control of corruption, so countries to the right-hand side in green in this circle are the well-governed countries in the world, countries basically above seven. And here you find some countries a little bit in the middle who are somewhere at uh, between four and six. What is it between four and six? Well, between four and six, you will find areas of government 
which function on the basis of ethical universalism. Let's say pensions go mostly to pensioners. Let's say about 20% of them will probably go to dead people or relatives of those who give the pensions, but just 20%. Okay, but there will be other areas which are fairly bad, in fact. There will be areas where, in fact, particular distribution, distribution on the basis, like government contracts, on the basis of connections will be the norm and will not be the exception. And as you can see from this graph very easily, most of the world is here. Most of the world is not here. So this is what we were supposed to build out of 2004, to move from the philosophy of ethical universalism as a governance principle to the practice, to build this practice in everyday life. My point of view is, of course, related to public distribution and universal distribution of public goods. Someone who's a lawyer would be more interested in equal treatment of the law, but in fact they're the same because you cannot have one without the other. So they go, unfortunately, they go together. So that also means that they subvert one another at times. So what, did we do something to promote this and to make this map more green? You, know, you see, green is a minority on this map. Well, we did something. We spent a lot. So development assistance was diversified, and on top of whatever aid developed countries were spending, a new category appeared, the category of spending to promote good governance. And of course, we are the champions of this. By we, I understand the Uni European Union who is the largest donor of the world. You have to put together member states and European institutions and United States, which if you just take states, of course, is number one donor of the world. Well, jointly, we really spend a lot on this. And who are the countries where we spend mostly? Of course, you know, most anti-corruption money, over a billion were spent on Iraq, Afghanistan, um, Ukraine, a top receiver, Egypt, Palestine, and I can only end by saying you this, that only on rule of law promotion, Europe gave Turkey over a decade more than one billion. And this is the one billion when whatever you see now was, was built. And this is basically the last, the last 10 years. So yes, we have expectations to see something. 20 years may be a short interval of time, but we are spending taxpayer money to put this into practice. And therefore, as long as we continue to do this, we might as well try to get some results. And this is why I think it is worth and legitimate to evaluate the, the results of what we do. Meanwhile, however, the world is not just what we plan to do. It's a real world out there and causes exist which subvert or enhance whatever efforts the government do. And one interesting thing what happened is that globalization didn't quite work exactly as we hoped it would work. What you see here is the top of fines given under Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, the world's actually only enforcement tool which works, for which we absolutely have to praise the United States and beg whatever government comes to the United States to in fact support this and not dissuade this because this is one thing which works. And one thing which happened, as you can see, is that it sort of made equality between the green areas and the rest. Because do you see any poor country which is in the red in this top fines? No. You see only countries which come from the top of the world, from countries which are in the green. On top of the world is the Banque Societe Generale in France, built a uh, fine last year with 1.3 billion. On second place is the Telia Company AB, a semi-public Swedish company. I cannot tell you that, you know, on top of good governance in the world, in some years it's Denmark number one, in other years it's Sweden number one, okay? And still you have this Swedish semi-public company bribing in Uzbekistan to win a contract for, for Uzbekistan communications. Siemens, the German company, is indicted in 18 different jurisdictions, in all of them for integrity problems, right? Trying to get preferential contracts. Wimpel, a Dutch company, one of the earliest examples of good governance. Alstom in France, Halliburton, and, and the rest, and the rest of the rest, okay? So, in the same years when we are promoting good governance, actually a rather subvertive process happens. And the fact that we now have universal trade with very few rules and the fact that Western companies try to trade in countries where corruption is the norm means that they go there and bribe. So 
unsurprisingly, or maybe surprisingly, the world doesn't really change in these 20 years. It stays very much flat. What you see here is evolution grouped by income, and you can see very easily that, in fact, surprising enough, the countries in the world in the green, which is the, are the OECD world, the richest countries which had the best governance, in fact, backslide. You will not be surprised because you've heard of Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, right, and lots of other looks, leaks, and other things like this. So what happens is that there is some regress in the green world. There is also some regress in the yellow world, which are higher middle income countries. Those have, are the closest in Seymour Martin Lipson's preconditions. Those should be the closest to good governance, except that he was not writing about good governance. He was writing about democracy, right? And most of these countries are democracies, but they are systematically corrupt democracies, and they don't progress over the past 20 years. They, in fact, regress a little bit. And then come the real poor countries, right? And the real poor countries just don't change. That is, that is the thing, okay? Meanwhile, meanwhile, conditions improve a little bit. Conditions improve a little bit because, in fact, despite this poor state of governance, we have the blue line of growth going a little bit up, right? And the red line is the red line of corruption, right? So the red line of corruption doesn't go anywhere, but the world does become a little bit more prosperous. So, you know, by modernization theory, you would say we do have a little bit better conditions. But I would argue that there, it's not as good as, as it looks, okay? So... Democracy, as you can see here, and rule of law, they both matter, but they matter mostly in the negative. Countries which are not democracies and which are these, the red big column, and countries which do not have rule of law, which are these, the shorter red column, this, they regress on control of corruption. However, the countries which are free, partly free and free, and the countries which enjoy rule of law, progress very little. To be honest, they don't progress at all. What you see here is progress between 000 and 005, which is really nothing. But at least they don't regress. So that's how the world looked in the past 20 years. Countries which are not free or don't have rule of law regressed a little bit, and the other countries didn't really didn't really change, with very few exceptions. I put together a book on success stories with Michael Johnson, and with our big effort, we found 10 case studies for the past 35 years. Of out of this, we had to qualify three, and every day I'm concerned when I see in the news that one of my country backslides, you know. <laughs> Say, no, 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 I'm not gonna lose, uh, you know, I'm not gonna come down to five or then I really retire. Go back to playwriting or something like this. Okay? One reason why this happened, I mean, I'm showing you here a more contemporary actor, although not really contemporary. After Napoleon, I have another hero of good governance promotion, and this is the Princeton finance professor, Edwin Kemmerer, who toured Latin America trying to stabilize it in the 20s and 30s, and who is actually the spiritual father of the world's best auditing agency, the Controller General of Chile, who's a wonderful agency, auditor, ombudsman, uh, and constitutional court had to have the right of judicial review in the same time. An ideal formula, why didn't everybody else adopt it? Well, this actually shows that it's not only the advice that you get, because he gave similar advice to all other Latin American countries, but the local conditions. It was only the Chilean elite who said, yes, let's have this and we're going to have a clean government. Why? Because they wanted this clean government and nobody else around did. So Kemmerer well put this very uh, insightful warning saying that it's not laws that do it. It's not laws that ensure progress of good governance. It's basically people. It's people. It's the number of people in the country if they want to do this or not. Well, my final argument on practices is that the reason why it didn't work out as well as we hoped, it's not that our intentions were not good or all this money is lost. You know, in many countries we started something and we perhaps will be able to build on this something. Although the countries which I found as success stories are completely different from the countries of international investment. My success stories are nearly all in full successes of domestic agency. And if there is Western influence, and there's a lot, it's basically emulation. Countries which wanted to be like a Western countries. Their elites, like in Georgia, were really very um, Americanized, and they drove themselves the process in that direction. Well, my argument is that the, inf the international influence has intended consequences, but also has unintended consequences. Yes, we have conditionalities, we have money, we can do, for instance, things we can condition 
to reduce resources for corruption. We have, for instance, in trade agreements such conditions where we try to reduce transaction costs for businesses. So that's a positive influence that we can play. But we also have a lot of unintended consequences. We also create a lot of resources for corruption simply by international intervention or by other things which go on internationally, by unaccountable flow of money, right? By the fact that Siemens go in 18 countries and they want to, you know, do business even in countries that they know are systematically corrupt. So there is no other way of doing business. The fact that they go there and other companies don't go there simply shows the commitment to, to integrity. So roughly international interventions have to be conceptualized of having both intended and unintended consequences. And then we'll understand a little bit better what happens. That's a bit complicated. I will ask you to read about this and I'll have to move on right now. So what is our record to date? So I would say like this, that for European Union, where my next Cambridge books comes out, I am rather negative. And I find, I must say, that areas where we had like the greatest power, jointly with the Americans in some point, like Kosovo and Bosnia, are also the areas where it's been the greatest disaster. So it's not that we have insufficient power which prevents this. It's simply in the nature of building good governance in other people's countries and the incapacity of building the political process which actually leads to good governance in the first place as an outsider which somehow subverts our process. So I do not have any, any uh, success story in Europe. I start with Greece and Italy and I end up with the Ghana and other places. US, I think it's, does, it's doing better than we are. So among my seven success stories, there are clearly stories of good American influence and intervention, but it's very long time intervention. It's 50, 60, 70 years times intervention. There are places like Taiwan and South Korea, for instance, right? Or there are places which emulate the Americans, Georgia or Estonia, but they're not direct intervention, but simply, you know, smart local elites who knew what they wanted and smart American advisors who sometimes pushed them, sometimes helped them, but they managed to create the political process which in the end takes us there. Georgia is a good example that I give, 100% domestic agency. They always hated donors. They were very critical towards donors. Today, we push them into standards anti-corruption, but their successes come from the time from where they didn't listen to us. And they simply did what Saakashvili and, and his staff wanted to do. But we also found, I mean, they did do it with our help. We also found this very unconventional way of helping them. When they fired the whole police and other people from the government, this special fund was created with donor money. We don't do this anymore these days. I mean, the aid we give is very conventional. We go there and we start building agencies. I have statistical evidence showing no agency ever worked anywhere, but it doesn't matter. That's very simple for donors to plan this way. And we just go, and these days we make five years anti-corruption plans. That is the latest, and I like this particularly since I grew up in Ceausescu, Romania. You know, I even read a report from a Swedish agency saying, oh, well, we lost one year and a half, so we have to do the five years in three years and a half, you know? And that's a comical film of my brother, which just takes this theme from the 80s, which was called five years and three years and a half, because this was one of Ceausescu's slogan in the 80s, okay? So, of course, this doesn't work, right? You, we know planning doesn't work, and if it doesn't work anywhere else, why would planning work so wonderfully well in, uh, you know, in development in general and in anti-corruption in, in particular? Okay, just a few words on, on our unintended consequences, because these unintended consequences, since I wrote this lecture in August, are all over us at an unprecedented pace, which surprises even the most negative people. Huh? Some unintended consequences that you may have seen around these days, right? So forgive me, just my angle of this story is that I'm sure that everybody looks in it from their you know, deeper American angle or deeper Democrat or deeper Republican or whatever. But from my point of view as an anti-corruption promoter in other countries, I look at this and I said, wasn't this bound to happen? I mean, after all, how many countries are there where we very strongly promote and condition development of good governance, where we tell people to fire general prosecutors or to hire general prosecutors, which is maybe something that we should think if it's a wise thing to do when, when you promote his independence of the judiciary in those countries. I mean, in how many of these countries would you say we are entirely free of interest with the international promoters? I mean, here is a very special interest in American elections. But to be honest, this only interests Americans. I mean, from my point of view, I think that 
if you look around, you will see that it's always an interest. Maybe there's some general contract going on and some big American or European company bids. You do not imagine that Siemens go to the German embassy or Siemens is not invited to the Bretton Woods uh, board meeting and I sit with them at the same table, the good governance table is called, right? It, it happens, right? So it's very difficult actually to find situations where promoters of good governance, being big governments with big companies, are completely free of interest. And you are sure that when you tell the Ukrainian government, fire the bloody prosecutor, you really are completely, you know, nobody can think of a reasonable circumstance in which you should actually not intervene simply because you are not free of interest. Just an example from my country, right? In my country, people don't read this story, but in my country we had uh, a couple of notorious corrupt business people who went into tr got into trouble, very serious trouble, and both of them were actually having a Western citizenship, so they did more than the usual people whom we put in jail. They really managed to build international coalitions to defend themselves. One is this Romanian-American businessman, Mr. Popovicu. This was a story in New York Times two weeks ago. Right, Mr. Popovicu has a complete fraudster. He managed to basically get the whole land of one of Bucharest airports to move it from the property of a university, the agriculture university, which was the owner into his own property, right? By fraud influencing the restitu land restitution committee, everything, everything. So there's no doubt of his guilt, like in some other cases. And he gets sentenced, right? He gets sentenced, and what does he do? He immediately hires a former American FBI director and his law firm to defend him. The American FBI director immediately finds the son of a president to go there and help him. And eventually this is not sufficient, and then Plus, you have to be bipartisan. And then he also hires Mr. Giuliani to help him. I mean, and everyone, I mean, imagine a little bit that you look at this from the perspective of a Romanian anti-corruption promoter, right? In the other story, the other guy, the other guy, the American ambassador, the American ambassador finishes his term, he goes to work for whom? For somebody sentenced for corruption, who has this big insurance company, which he defrauded, by the way, right? What is he supposed to do in his capacity? To help this company gain trust and list in the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, really. And these are the people whom I heard myself in the past 10 years making anti-corruption speeches and explaining the importance of good governance. And I think people are entitled to do whatever they do, but maybe they should not make these good governance strong speeches. Huh? That would somehow be from my point of view, less risky, less risky, if no, nothing else. So problem number one, an unintended consequence, is very few situations where we're free of conflict of interest and where double standards will not immediately come back and hurt what we do. Because, you know, for instances like this, a lot of other clean instances might be in doubt. The second instance, we have encouraged a certain brand of anti-corruption, the repressive brand of anti-corruption, which is nonsensical in systematically corrupt countries anyway, and which hasn't bring, brought any happiness even to Italy. In Italy, you only have 11% people who say there's less corruption now than before money put it. But anyway, this is what we encourage, because that's what we understand. This is what would work in developed countries. And since people who promote this, they really don't know very well the countries that they work on, they go on and say, why don't you arrest some ministers without realizing that this is actually discrimination. You should arrest all the ministers. And the next minister who would come would do exactly the same. There are other reforms which would cut the rents, and we know which those are. I mean, we know we have scholarship on this, and we also have practice, no? Because Estonia did it, Georgia did it. I mean, there are countries which did it. We know how to do this, okay? Except that we don't take our inspiration from this countries. We go on and, and arrest people, right? So what happened when we start arresting people, you know, if particularly people who are in government from the main parties? Well, what happened are that other people take advantage. Who's going to take advantage, you know? Some uh, clean, uh, hipster, Harvard-educated uh, party? No. It's going to take advantage some strong people who speak a strong language and who manage to get themselves elected. And then we might actually end up that we haven't solved the good governance problem. And of course, they will inherit the rents and the rest. But what will happen is that we might have created a democracy problem. Three, number one, number third risk or unintended consequences. We raise standards very high. I mean, I fully agree with this. I was the first to be completely fundamentalist during these 20 years, but I also had fundamentalistic 
standards, you know. I always refused everything. I always did this. But that didn't happen for people who are in politics. It didn't happen at all. Maybe you have noticed that Emmanuel Macron, who's number one champion in good governance in Europe, the renew Europe thing, right? He tries to repeatedly to propose commissioners who are in conflict of interest. His number one choice, in fact, had now admitted her guilt for fictional employment of some of her assistants and returned the money to European Parliament. And he was very surprised. He said he doesn't understand why he was why she was uh, not passed. Well, she was not passed because the Romanian commissioner and the Hungarian commissioner, for far less than this, were not passed. And it was such a striking conflict of interest that we have a nice clean party in Europe who are the Greens. And the Greens said, no, we're not going to vote for Mrs. Goulard. But then, you know, maybe Mrs. Goulard is not a bad person. When she was in the European Parliament or in the French Parliament, this was the rule. They were all doing this. Le Figaro last summer wrote about, we said, why is Macron so tough on nepotism on the French Senate? After all, hiring of one's first degree relatives, they said, is just down to 18%. So why is he making such a fuss about this? I mean, imagine the sons in law or the whatever. In Romania, this is illegal. You go to jail. We managed to put a couple of people to jail, okay? So we have reached a point when the, sta the double standards are really very striking. So either we narrow them down or we lower down the standards. I mean, there's no other way around it, okay? Otherwise, it's simply too unjust. Four, we end up by doing what the populists would have done anyway. Macron is closing down the Ecole Normale of Administration, a top school which was associated with, you know, Napoleon Code and the promotion of the French model. And, you know, the fact that he's closing it down, he may know what he's doing, although... This is what people told him in his debates around France. He has this consultation system. He selected people randomly who came and spoke. And what did people send in focus groups? We hate these technocrats who come to government. I mean, very much what we heard, in the Brexit and the other thing. We don't want people educated in, in administration schools to be in government. We want the government to belong to the people, right? And look, look, at, his, look at his demonstration his, of his motivation. He roughly said, if we want to build a society of equal opportunity and national excellence, we must reset the rules for recruitment, career, and access. No longer this, okay? And here I cite in the paper Baron de Montesquieu, who is in his wisdom, he said equality is the greatest thing of all and can only be defeated by an excess of equality. Because in the excess of equality, people would say, why should only people with medical studies operate a sick man? Why can't I do it, you know? And this is how I started my life in 1990, at the first disagreement as a f journalist, person among the people who created a free press in, in Romania, um, we had a disagree it was all ideal for five weeks. We just confiscated all the print uh, paper from the communist newspaper since they had no courage to come out of the house. And we just took it like ours, that's a revolution. And we printed our revolutionary newspaper and the print press workers printed for us. And all was very well, but five weeks later we sort of had some political disagreements because they were very much in favor of some form of continuing communism and we were very much in favor of free market and other things. And when they had a disagreement, the first thing that they said was, why should students write newspapers? Why shouldn't we, print workers, write our own newspapers? Which, by the way, I agree. I mean, print press workers must have their own newspapers. And they said, we're not going to print this. So I sadly heard this year, this uh, evening, that museum had closed one small piece in a museum, this, uh, this museum of uh, freedom of the press in Washington, D.C., was issue number 13 of my student dissident um, journal, Opinia Studentsaska, which is half empty. Because when they asked us to take out certain articles, the print press workers, because they disagreed with it, we just printed in its stead. We said this article could not appear because it doesn't agree with the, with the print press workers. And they agreed to print that, okay? So we printed this issue, which is half... Um, so... Let's be a little bit attentive. I mean, equality is very good, but finally, the Samaritan dilemmas which plague our work, and this is a daily thing. This is not just a risk, but this is a reality. The fact that a whole industry of anti-corruption was created, and this industry is full of people who actually want to generate work for themselves, and you have an army of lawyers out there who are very interested in whistleblower protection laws because what they know, okay? So what they're doing is that they're promoting whistleblower protection laws to countries which have no freedom of the press. Okay, so imagine against whom people are going to whistleblow, I mean. 
So, and that is going on quite a lot, and that is a very negative factor because, in fact, this has a fantastic routine and it's going to continue with the logic of self-preservation and self-promotion of things like this. And finally, you know, everything we have done, the fact that we are so visibly promoting good governance everywhere, that we have this army of people going, have created an extraordinary demand. And I see as the top risk of this that we might not be able to live up to this demand. In fact, I see this quite consistently. And I think that this is, in fact, the number one question. Everyone now expects us to deliver. Now, can we, can we really deliver? We have two alternatives, I would think. I mean, one alternative is that we tune this down and we try to put the dragon back into the egg. I'll let you try it. I mean, we're, no, no, we're all practiced since we're Game of Thrones fans. We know how this is done. And the second is we really have to ride this dragon. But riding a dragon, of course, is not an easy thing. But this is the ride which expects us in the next 10 years with all these extraordinary expectations that we unleashed. And I'm going to leave you with this. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for that uh, jam-packed uh, presentation, which really was fascinating. Uh, I couldn't uh, bring myself to cut you off, but we have... I was looking at you. You should have been more second. <laughs> In any case, we have a few minutes for some questions from the floor, so uh, let me not use up any more time and see if anyone would like to pose a question. There are microphones on either side if you'd like to line up there. And I see David Epstein is here first. Why don't we ask him? I, wanted, I wondered whether you could compare uh, promotion of anti-corruption with promotion of democracy. <laughs> Should we be doing one in preference to the other? Is it possible to promote anti-corruption without promoting democracy? If you promote democracy, is that sufficient as a guard against corruption? And if not, why is it that democracies are unable to control corruption? Because it seems as though corrupt rulers enriching themselves would be a very obvious uh, point to make in an election to defeat them. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I have a microphone here. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this. It's like four or five difficult questions into one. But shortly put, we do like this. Due to the extraordinary success of democracy 20 years ago, because this is how we should look at it as a success. Due to the extraordinary success of democracies, we now have twice as many democracies which are systematically corrupt than autocracies. <laughs> <laughs> simply because autocracies are very few in number. I mean, fewer in numbers, right? And if you look at what happened, for instance, at the quality of bureaucracy for the past 20 years, the only countries which progressed, except, again, Estonia and Georgia, the only countries which progressed are countries very similar, in a way, to European absolute monarchies, which invented the word bureaucracies. I mean, the only points on the map are Qatar, United Arab Emirates, they invested a little bit in bureaucracies, or anyway, in ICRG, the only institution which measures this. This is where you see the only places where you see development of bureaucracies. Now, the answer to this was in Weber already, because Weber compared the United States with European countries. And then there is work from the 60s, and Weber looks at the first generation of countries, right? He writes in 1918, it's his major essay on bureaucracies. And then in 1956, we have something by Samuel Eisenstadt, also insightful, looking at completely different generation of countries. And then we have what I do, which I look at the last 30 years of countries. Well, the conclusion is the same. Democracies, if you start having competitive elections first without having a bureaucracy, autonomous from private interest, democracies do not build bureaucracies. They don't, because like the American government that Weber remarked, Weber says fantastic bureaucracies have appeared in Europe. These bureaucracies act impersonally and they're largely autonomous from private interest. Why? Because they had been developed by monarchs against aristocrats and then in the process of constitutionalization of monarchies, they simply become autonomous. But by then they were rather established. Democrats don't do this. Democrats just reshuffle government whenever they come. 
because the, what they bring is that they bring in their own people, which is very much like the American history. And Weber was optimistic about America. He said, one day maybe America will realize the value of, uh, of having a real bureaucracy, not just each government comes, fires everybody, and employs new people who afterwards are part of this, of this patronage uh, pyramids. But for this, a very strong public demand will have to exist, and the public opinion should play the role that the European monarchs play in developing these instruments. Well, this is what we expect to happen in the future. It didn't happen now. From my perspective, as someone who looks at good governance, I can say that I think it is very important that rights are promoted, that rights, universal rights and access. I think that this is the fundamental thing that we should promote. Elections without rights have absolutely no value, to be honest, and, in, uh, and the impact of elections on good governance is zero. Democrats just come and inherit the rents, and parties only exist to spoil the government. This is how it works, and that's why people don't want parties anymore these days. So it is really a big problem in all these new democracies, parties, and it's been like now 15 years since parties and legislators are the most unpopular, least trusted, and considered the most corrupt around the world. Right? So let's promote rights. Let's promote rights, let's promote equality, let's promote access, and let's promote any forms of representation, because representation, political representation, seems to be very difficult. So any other forms that we can find to promote representation and support people being represented and, and taking their share that should be theirs from the public resources, that, that might work better. Sorry, not having a better answer for this. Uh, it's not an easy question. Okay, Carl. Yeah, I just, I just really want to follow up on that. If you could elaborate, you know, beyond rights. I mean, what works? Is it pressure from below? Is it if free media? Is it civil society that can create accountability? What works? <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Well, I have created uh, a, a trick, you know. So after researching all this, I thought what is easier to do. And what is easier to do, I put on a website which is called Integrity Index, so it's www.integrity-index.org, where I grouped together the six things which have like the highest impact on corruption. And they're grouped also by convenience of data. You have to understand that we have this problem. So they can be also, if one understands the model, everyone can do a similar index at subnational level or at sector level. Basically, the argument is that corruption is the result of uh, opportunity creation, creating resources for corruption, and therefore you have to reduce those. And it's also the creation of constraints to corruption. So you have to increase constraints and reduce opportunities. Now, that is, however, very complex, and the part of this depends. Reducing opportunities largely depends on government. So governments have to uh, cut transaction costs, Basically, that's what we have there, increase fiscal spending transparency. In particular, make all the contracts transparent, right? Do things like this, digitalize government and the rest. But that very much depends on government. So if you have a government which doesn't want to do this, although we know that this works, this is not like saying that it works. It doesn't, because it means that you have to have the political will of government. So, you know, what we can do, put it in all the trade treaties, except that meanwhile we no longer have trade treaties, but, you know, when we're <laughs> going to have trade treaties back again. So this is where conditionalities should look at. Cutting rents, increasing competition, opening access. It's all about opening access. You don't have to fight corruption directly. <coughs> what you have to do is simply, you know, remove, remove these legal privileges which exist in many of these countries and which are then transferred from one government to another, even from one regime to another. But then, of course, it's them who, who should do it, okay? So this is not a lesson for donors. We should ask for that and not for arrests. That is what we should ask for. Okay, on the side of constraints, on the side of constraints, we can do a lot. There are two very political things, freedom of the press and judicial independence. They are both indispensable. But what do they mean, you know, in many ways? I mean, I think we can do things. I think we can help more freedom of the press, but in a non-stereotypical way, countries don't need lessons from us on investigative journalism. In some of the poor, corrupt countries, there are some of the greatest investigative journalists which exist, but they don't have anywhere where to publish. So what we need to do are media funds, try to bring clean investment into the media. Media is everywhere. Media is endangered in Western countries. I mean, let's face it, newspapers I didn't expect. If I saw you the two Romanian business people, where are articles published in their defense? 
in the top Western media. I got a call from an American journalist a month ago on Mr. Popovich, the same related with Bi both Biden and Giuliani. Guy told me he got the Pulitzer Prize and he's now doing a documentary on Mr. Popovich. Don't I want to appear and explain that he should also have rights in his documentary? So, you know, they can really buy everyone. Media is in a very bad shape. Unless we help media in these countries, we can't rely on media to help us. Media is completely captured, right? Judicial independence is the most difficult, very difficult to do something from outside. And in the end, citizens, citizens building associations, helping people, helping people associate through internet. So I created this category which is called e-citizens, enlightened or digital citizens. Uh, if I know how many people have internet connections and are associated through infamous Facebook, meanwhile, I can predict 70% of control of corruption. So that's what we have to do, to help people organize themselves, to help people in health, in education, in groups, not just few NGOs in the countries, to defend their communities, more or less, this is what works. There are no silver bullets or anything else which, which works otherwise. Okay, we're running late, so what I'm gonna do is ask, take all the remaining questions, and then leave it to you to sum up, uh, Alina. So let's go to this side first. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> Please try to be brief, though. Uh, yes, uh, you spoke about um, the UN Convention Against uh, Corruption. And the UN itself, it's a, you know, a group of many countries, some top uh, countries, some others. And uh, when you look where they work, there is a lot of corruption, including my country where I am from 20 years of UN peacekeepers. Corruption is just obvious to the eyes. <laughs> so where do we go from here? Uh, I feel like uh, there is no path out. Thank you. Okay, let's take one from this side quickly. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my question was about the relation uh, between democracy and good governance that has already been asked. Uh, but I'd still go on with asking you about what, what place affirmative action has in, your, uh, in this uh, thesis of uh, ethical universalism. Okay, Anders. Anders Olsen from the Atlantic Council. Uh, thank you for an excellent uh, lecture. Give, let me give a few quick uh, points. Huh. I'm surprised that you expect everything to come from outside. The general lesson is that everything has to come from inside. If it's not owned at home, uh, it won't work. And uh, the second point is that it has to be fast. I like that you said that it goes too slowly, but you didn't emphasize the speed. I was surprised that you didn't mention Estonia as the greatest success of all the uh, post-communist transition countries as the outstanding example, a bit better, I would say, than Georgia, but uh, otherwise very similar. It all came from inside. And then with regard to a uh, UN convention, as uh, my colleague here said, a uh, UN convention is a very light uh, thing. There is no international organization for uh, global good governance, then we shouldn't expect it uh, to develop. This is what is needed. The IMF has b built good market economies throughout the world. You need a strong international organization that can work together with reformist uh, governments uh, uh, to get it done. And then how to reduce the opportunities Transparency, transparency, transparency. The uh, four Scandinavian countries uh, introduced good transparency in the 18th century. That's why corruption is limited. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Anders. And last one. Um, so the NED and the various institutions associated with the NED were established about 30 years ago with a very specific mission of promoting democracy. What would a NED for anti-corruption look like? Okay. okay, you respond to those you feel able. <laughs> all right. Okay, thank you very much for all these excellent questions. So, I do not think that promotion of democracy and promotion of, um, of good governance can be set apart. I simply would not be able to distinguish them. I know that the industry of democracy promotion has been very, very much uh, organized around elections and observing elections and electoral corruption and, and things like this. And this, of course, is, uh, is very, very good. But the thing is that in the end of the day, people like having elections if they will 
have something delivered by those elections. So we cannot simply separate this. We have to do both. They, they will have to come jointly. I think in the end of the day that people like having elections or like unseating leaders. Uh, that's something very convenient. If you, I remember that um, Ronald Inglehart and Pippa Norris uh, did a world value survey where they tried to see what values are universal and are not. And in fact, democracy came out fairly universal. Everybody said, oh, we elect our leaders. Yes, we'd like to. And seat our leaders, I would like to even better, you know, punish the best. But when they were asked, but would you like women to be equal with men, there was far less consensus around the world, okay? So here is where, where we start from, and that's my answer on affirmative action. Affirmative action is obviously an exception to ethical universalism. In my book, I explain exactly that ethical universalism is the ruling principle in governance, except when you need to redress, and you need to redress injustices. And those redress of injustices have to be weighted from society to society and circumstance of circumstance, and people should decide themselves what they want to do, but definitely following a period of great injustice, you have to have some redress. Only you have to explain this redress, and the society has to agree that this is, this is what you want to do. Otherwise, you won't be able to impose it uh, top down anyway. Now, the argument that the United Nations Convention Against Corruption is weak and the UN system is not going to impose it. Of course it's not. But on the other hand, the fact that you have this norm, I think it's quite extraordinary in itself. I was the first seven, eight years ago, which made me very unpopular with UN organizations, to simply run at the time there were only 130 countries which had adopted UNCAC. So I simply ran a statistics to see if countries which adopt UNCAC progress more than countries which don't, which who only turn out to adopt it later. And of course, that wasn't significant. I mean, countries was just, were just adopting it to adopt it. But then, you know, I mean, let's be attentive. I mean, countries adopted it formally, but then the population look at the demand which goes out out there. So there is no formal adoption. You know, if the energy exists in the country and if there are bad economic times, it, people will always raise for equality. And as Tocqueville stopped, there is something divine in the progress of equality. Equality will continue to progress. The thing is that, you know, sometimes people want things that are unreachable. People in Lebanon want things that I do not know how they're going to get. So I think it is indeed very early to assess a norm which only in 2004 I said, how long is it since women were proclaimed equal with the men and what is the record of gender policies around the world? <laughs> I mean, come on, is this small? And lots, lots, lots of other things. All right, so this is just the latest comer. This is just the later comer. And the comer, you know, is, has very great potential. But as I try to say, you know, since we killed the other revolutions, the ideological revolutions, I sometimes have the impression, looking around my PhD students and the kind of very enthusiastic people around me and the kind of ideas that we have of doing things, and then sometimes I say, didn't I hear this before? Didn't I read this before? Oh, yes, I heard and I did it because in my youth I used to teach a class of political doctrines, and I read this, uh, you know, uh, this anarchist in the 20s and 30s. So I said, you know, guys, let's, let's calm this down. I mean, yes, we need to improve government, but not on the cost of killing democracy. So what I'm thinking is that I'm going to see a lot of countries where the situation is going to get worse before of this great appetite for equality and for good governance. But as I said, we, we really cannot stop it. And UN is not going to do this. But foreign corrupt practices is going to do this. And we have other instruments. We have OECD, the anti-corruption instrument. And in the end of the day, I think that step by step, by unifying standards and what the internationals should do, internationals should take care of the international part. Of course, domestic agency is going to do the rest. But we're not taking care of international part. I mean, it's never been so much money laundering. And there are people, that's not my expertise, but there are people like Gabriel Zuckman and other people who have proposals on this. And it's not like... Uh, you know, people are moving on to cl close the loopholes and they're doing this. So there are things that we can do internationally to, to stop a little bit, uh, at least the, in the international part. Otherwise, nationally, what I think we should do is just stop this promotion of five years plans and go rather for cutting resources for corruption. Copy Estonia, as Anders said, Estonia actually is my favorite country and uh, number one in all my books, right? And you can find on YouTube an interview by me with the former Estonian Prime Minister, Mart Lahr. Just check my name and Mart Lahr. And you're gonna see what he says. He was the first to say arresting people, it's easy. 
but nonsensical. What you have to do is change hardcore regulation. All right, and he's also going to explain, explains in his interview how they did it and uh, how, the, how was this case so successful. Only, you know, it's not an easy case to, to emulate because it starts with 20 clean people who, want, who are anti-communist and wanting to build something very different from the communist government and not enrich themselves. And that's not something that we all have in our countries. It's not so easy to get by these 20 people. Uh, well, thank you for uh, responding to all those questions for a, a fascinating lecture. Please join me in applauding the room.